So today we're going to pick up the, the spinal cord. And this portion of the central nervous system has four functions. Conduction. to move information. To provide neural integration. And that neural integration is going to be received from multiple inputs. So these multiple inputs are going to be Evaluated the information contained, and then we actually have some response that can be actuated in here. We don't have to go all the way back up to the brain to get those central processing decisions. So, an appropriate response can be dictated and actuated right from the spinal cord. The spinal cord is also going to be our primary location of <clears throat> for locomotion. The spinal cord will coordinate the movement. do have to rely on higher brain centers to dictate speed, distance, and direction. So to provide some of those more decision-based characteristics of locomotion. So the actual control of the muscle and the coordinating of contraction is going to happen in the spinal cord, but the decisions on how fast to walk, the distances to walk, and what direction to walk are going to be the responsibility of these higher brain centers. And then finally, the spinal cord is responsible for many of our reflexes. And a reflex is just simply an expected response to a stimuli. So those are the four basic functions of the spinal cord. And before we move deeper into physiology, let's take a look at some of the some of the gross spinal anatomy. So this figure that you have here shows uh, our spinal cord anatomy. You're going to see that we have our spinal cord and then spinal nerves coming off of the spinal cord. We have the spinal nerves named based off of the uh, location that they extend from. So you can see that the spinal nerve that comes below the vertebrae T1 is going to be known as the T1 nerve. Uh, so anatomically, the spinal cord extends from the base of the brain stem and it begins, the technical point of beginning is at the point where the spinal cord and the brain stem leave the skull, which is through that large hole called the foramen, foramen magna. You recognize this as being the large hole at the base of the skull. 
in adults, the spinal cord itself extends to the vertebrae L1. And that's what you can see here. Here is L1, lumbar vertebrae number one. And this is going to be the base or the <clears throat> very tip of the spinal cord in adults. And the spinal cord itself is really a cylinder of nervous tissue. And that cylinder of nervous tissue gives rise to 31 individual spinal nerves. Uh, I, I said individual, 31 pairs of spinal nerves. So 31 pairs of spinal nerves extending off of this cylinder of nervous tissue. Uh, this is just a slightly different view of the spinal column with the nerves all labeled here as they extend off of the spinal cord. The first nerve is going to extend off of the spinal cord between the bones of the skull and vertebrae C1. So here would be the base of the skull, here would be vertebrae C1, and there's a nerve that extends right through there called C1. There is a bulge of nervous tissue in the spinal cord that is near C1. And because it's associated with the cervical vertebrae, we call it the cervical enlargement. This will provide nerves to the upper arms, upper portion of the arms. The remaining nerves, most of them are going to travel through the vertebral foramen. So they're going to protrude from the spinal cord through the foramen on the vertebrae. Um, <clears throat> all the way down to the lumbar region. And we're going to find another bulge that's just above L1. So just above lumbar vertebrae number one, and we're going to call this the lumbar enlargement. And from this particular bulge of tissue, we're going to have the nerves that run to the pelvis and lower. Now at this point, at the very tip of the spinal column, right here at L1, we have several nerves that extend off of the spinal column. And these nerves are going to be inferior to the lumbar enlargement. So I'm going to abbreviate as LE. And so we get this tapered point. So inferior to the lumbar enlargement, we have this tapered point. And that tapered point, it's actually going to be contained within a sac. And that part of the 
spinal cord is going to be called the medullary cone. So the spinal cord itself, we have the features of the lumbar, I'm sorry, the cervical enlargement, the lumbar enlargement, and then the medullary cone. Now, if you go back, and I told you that the spinal nerves extend from the spinal cord through the vertebral foramen, and I told you that we have neurons, uh, I'm sorry, nerves that uh, protrude from C1 all the way to L1. So C1 to L1, count those up, those are going to be 20 pairs. And so then the question becomes if there are 31 pairs, where are the other 11 pairs of, neuron, uh, of nerves, spinal nerves? We have spinal nerves that we would label L2 through S5. There are 11 additional pairs. And these are going to not extend from or through the vertebral foramen as the other 20 spinal nerves do, but they are going to extend from the medullary cone. So they extend from the medullary cone. Now, this grouping of spinal nerves that extend from the medullary cone, it makes it look sort of like the wispy hair of a horse's tail. And so these nerves collectively are called the caudae equina. The spinal nerve, I'm sorry, the spinal cord can be broken up into regions and they're based off of the associated vertebrae. So at the very top of the spinal cord, we have the cervical region, which contains the eight cervical spinal nerves. The thoracic region containing the 12 thoracic spinal nerves, the lumbar region, which will contain L1, but will also contain the lumbar, the lumbar enlargement and the uh, medullary cone, and then the nerves of caudae equina. And then the last portion of, so here's our spinal portion with our caudae equina, and then the last portion here uh, will be our sacral region. And you can see those regions here, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. Now, the spinal cord can be cross-sectioned as well, and there is several points of anatomy that are important to discuss here in this segment that can be cross-sectioned. So the cross-section you have here, you can still see the bone of the vertebrae. And then within the column, we have the spinal cord and then the nerves that leave from the spinal cord. This bottom picture shows the spinal column uh, separate from the ver vertebral bones. Now, if you look at the very center of 
this final column. We're going to call that the medial section. And there are going to be three medial openings. And those three medial openings, one's going to be anterior, one's going to be in the middle, and one's going to be posterior. The anterior opening is called the anterior median fissure. The posterior opening is going to be the median sulcus. And then in the middle is a structure called the central canal. So we have those medial openings in the middle of in the middle of the spinal column. And as you look at this as we go to the exterior where the spinal nerves begin to extend off of the spinal cord, you can see that we're going to have both anterior and posterior, anterior and posterior extensions leading to the spinal nerve. So we have anterior and posterior roots that merge. So the roots come off of the spinal column and they merge to form a spinal nerve. Now what you'll see here is on the posterior side, the extensions, the roots come off and they form this bulge. That bulge is known as a ganglion and the ganglion is going to be the location of the cell bodies for those neurons that are incorporated in this particular spinal nerve. Specifically, we would call that the posterior root, because it's coming off of the root and it's on the back side or posterior side, and it's a ganglion. It's the posterior root ganglion. Now, if we got even a higher resolution of detail, what you would find is that there are small little roots or rootlets that give rise to individual roots that lead into the spinal nerve. So each of those roots that are formed are formed from smaller roots called rootlets that are actually coming out of the spinal cord. You can see that there is blood supply and then covering the spinal cord you have these um, different sheaths. These are uh, protective sheaths that are known as meninges. These are fibrous sheaths that surround the spinal cord and help to protect it and also to um, allow a cavity to form for cerebral spinal fluid. Now, you've heard of meningitis before. Meningitis is inflammation of these meninges, both in the brain and possibly in the spinal cord as well. There are actually going to be three separate layers of these spinal meninges. The very outer layer, which you can see represented here, is going to be called the dura mater. And this literally means the durable mother. And this is going to be a looser exterior sac that is very protective. Then we have a middle layer here, and you can see that it looks very wispy in its composition. This middle layer has the appearance of a spider web, and so we call this the arachnoid. Modern. 
this means the spidery mother because it has the appearance of this sort of spider web type structure. And then the very inner layer is going to be called the pia mother, which means the delicate mother. So this is the most delicate of the covering. Now each of these layers uh, or meninges are going to form space in between the vertebrae uh, and in particular the dura mater. So the space between the vertebrae and then the dura mater you can see in this example here, kind of in this golden yellowish color, there would be space around there, separating the vertebral, the bone, from the spinal cord because of the dura mater. That space is called the epidural space. Because it exists just above the dural mater, the dura mater. During childbirth, you may be aware that occasionally the woman will receive an epidural. This is where the drug or the anesthesia chemical is going to be put in to induce that anesthesia effect. will be within this space. Now the arachnoid mater, which I'm going to abbreviate as the AM, is attached to the dura mater, which I'm going to abbreviate as DM. And there are tiny little fibers that then extend to the pia mater. So there's this transition from the dura mater to the arachnoid mater, and then the pia mater, this inner layer, uh, this inner meningi, there are small little tiny fibers, which you can actually see them here. So there's not much space here, but then space with these tiny fibers here attaching the arachnoid mater to the pia mater. And again, this makes it look like a spider web. And the term arachnoid mater literally means resembling a spider's web. Now, it looks like a spider web in those little fibers, so we might have the arachnoid mater here, and then the dura mater here, and then we have these fibers. So this is space. So there's going to be space that is formed between the arachnoid mater and the pia mater. And it's sort of space around those fibrous webs. This space is what's going to be filled with cerebral spinal fluid, CSF. Cerebral spinal fluid. That space is technically going to be called the subarachnoid space. subarachnoid space becomes a sac that's known as the uh, 
becomes a sac known as the lumbar cistern. Becomes the lumbar cistern. And this is going to be the pouch, if you will, that carries the medullary cone. So this leads into the medullary cone of the spinal cord. Now, surrounding the spinal cord itself, on the very inside here is that very thin layer called the pia mater. So this lines the spinal cord. And again, it's called the delicate, clear meningi because it's transparent in color. So it's a transparent membrane. And through this transparent membrane, we're going to have occasional connections or cords that attach to the dura mater. These are called the denticulate ligaments. Denticulate ligaments. After we reach the medullary cone, the pia mater is going to form fibrous cords. So after the medullary cone, we have the pia mater forming these fibrous cords. These fibrous cords are going to be called the terminal phylum. These fibrous cords eventually fuse with the other mater, in particular the dura mater. So we get this fusing of the pia mater to the dura mater, and this forms a structure called the coccygeal ligament. The coccygeal ligament is going to be attached to vertebrae C01, so the first coccygeal vertebrae. And this really holds, in part, the uh, entire meningi covering over the spinal cord, holds it in place at the very tip of the, uh, of the spinal cord. So if we look, oh, I'm sorry, if we look directly here at the very top of the spinal column, uh, that cross section, what you're going to see is there's two distinct types of tissue, really the two types of nervous tissue. Those two types of nervous tissue going to be gray and white matter. So gray and white matter. The gray matter is going to have a dull color. And it is gray in color because it has very little myelin. Myelin is a very whitish coloration. And with low amounts of myelin, the nervous tissue is very gray in color.
primarily what we're going to find here in terms of the neuronal structure, the structure of the neurons. In the gray area, we're going to find um, parts of the neurons that aren't associated with myelin, which are primarily going to be the somas and the dendrites. So the cell bodies and the dendrites. Uh, in addition, this is where we're going to have neuron-neuron contact. So this is where two neurons are going to come together to make contact. This anatomical makeup of neuron-neuron contacts allows integration. So this gray matter is here in the middle. It looks like it has some wings and a body here. And then the rest of this here is going to be the white matter. And it has a pearly white color. And the reason that it has a pearly white color is because of the presence of that very white tissue called myelin. Myelinated tissue of the nervous system is going to have that very white appearance. This is primarily going to be bundles of axons. Now if you look here at the structure you can see that we have kind of little sections here. And each of these little sections is going to be called a track. And these tracks are going to be axons that run up and down the spinal cord. And those tracks act as signal buses. They move pieces of information along that track following the axons of the neurons that are contained. Okay, so the gray matter is in the middle of the cross section. I've already pointed out. And it does look like it has a set of wings. So here's one of our wings, and here's the other wing, and then we have this piece in here that looks kind of like a body. Now those wings, you can see that there are sort of horn-like structures, tips of the wings. So the tips of the wings on the anterior side, or can also be referred to as the ventral side, we're going to call those horns. So the anterior or ventral horn. Now, occasionally, and you can see it here in this particular picture, you have this little protrusion on the side of the gray matter. That doesn't happen everywhere within the spinal cord, but between the second thoracic vertebrae and the first lumbar vertebrae, we're going to have those protrusions, and those are facing in the lateral direction, and we'll just simply call those lateral horns. So between thoracic 2 and lumbar 1. And then we also have those posterior protrusions. And those can be posterior or dorsal horns. Now right here in the middle, this small little section there that attaches the two wings together, that structure, which actually contains what's known as the central canal, is known as the gray connoisseur. So we'll have our different wings 
uh, and then the different horns on those different wings, and then this middle section here containing the central female called the gray conosaur. Now the gray matter is going to be encased by white matter. White matter is going to surround the gray matter. And what you can see is there are three columns. We're going to have a column here, a column here, and a column here. So three columns on either side, and these are called funiculi. So three column, columns on either side of the spinal cord called funiculi. Funiculi is the, going to be the plural. The singular is going to be funiculus. And as you probably are beginning to guess, on the front side here, we're going to have the anterior or ventral funiculus. On the sides here, we'll have the lateral funiculus and then on the back side we'll have the posterior or dorsal funiculus. Now, each of these individual funiculi are going to have their own track of neuron axons. So within each of these little sections, you're going to have the axons of individual neurons. These tracts or bundles of neurons are going to be called fascicles. So this next figure, um, just to kind of expand just a little bit on the white matter and the contained tracks. So the white matter consists, again, of tracks. And these are going to be bundles of neurons, and really bundles of the um, axons of those neurons bundled together as nerves, bundled together as tracks. These tracks are bundles of nerves which are carrying information. And what you can see here in, in red, these are going to be the bundles of nerves, and you can see that they expand out within the brain. Uh, they are, are going in a variety of different directions. These bundles of nerves carrying information, they can carry information in two directions. They can carry uh, information to the brain, and we're going to call that ASEN. So neurons and nerves, bundles of nerves in these tracts that carry information from sensory organs to the brain are going to be ascending tracts. So information coming in from sensory organs that are headed up to the brain.
but we also can have information that is leaving from the brain and going out towards the body or leaving from the spinal cord up towards the body. These will be referred to as descending tracks. And these will be bundles of nerves carrying motor input or impulses from the central nervous system out to the body. Now, each of these tracks, whether they're ascending or descending, as a general rule, there are going to be three nerve bundles that will define or make up a track. And so you can see we have a neuron that runs here in purple from the sensory organ up the spinal cord. Then we have another neuron that runs up to some integrating center or higher brain center, and then another uh, neuron that runs out to uh, another location within the brain. So these bundles of nerves are going to be called first, second, and third order. neurons, depending on what bundle, which of, the, which of the three nerve bundles are associated with. A first order neuron, we are going to have information going from the sensory organs to the spinal cord or brain stem. So this first order neuron is going to be what takes information from the sensory tissue, goes through the spinal cord, and terminates either within the spinal cord or up into the brain stem someplace. Next we're going to have a second order neuron. And that second order neuron is going to form a synapse with the first order neuron. And so it will be from the first order synapse and typically goes to the thalamus. So here's the thalamus here. Here's our synapse. Runs up to thalamus from that synapse with the first order neuron. Now it leads into the thalamus because the thalamus is going to be the part of the brain that acts as a gateway to the rest of the brain. The thalamus itself is considered to sit at the upper end of the brain stem and then everything above that would be proper brain tissue. From the thalamus to some sensory region of the cerebral cortex we're going to have our third order neuron. from that synapse of the second order in the thalamus to a sensory region of the cerebral cortex. And these sensory regions are all over. There's different parts of the cerebral cortex that will have different sensory uh, functions. Now, what you're seeing here is we're starting on one side of the body. So the sensory tissue is over here on the right-hand side. 
and leads up and then terminates on the left hand side of the brain. And what we are uh, occasionally going to find out is that the tracks deviate. Again, this is occasion. So it'll start out on the right side, and eventually it will lead up to the opposite side of the body once we get to the cerebral cortex. Kind of bring you back here to this picture again. You can see here's the, another example where we start out on one side and we end up over on the other side. Those points of deviation are called uh, decussation. And this is going to occur as we go up the spinal cord. The track may go to the left or to the right or opposite. So it may start out left and stay left, or start out right and stay right, or start out on one side and go to the other side. And I'm just going to call that opposite. So it starts out right, goes left, or starts out left, goes right. Now, these decussations, we can actually uh, describe them, characterize them, by comparing the point of origin to the end point in the brain. And there are basically two, op uh, two options. Start left, end left, start right, end right, we would call the same thing. We would call those ipsilateral. So ipsilateral ends on the same side as it began. So we're not going to actually exhibit a, a des, uh, desiccation. The other option is to go contralateral. And this is just simply going to be the track that ends on the opposite side. Starts left, goes ends right, or starts right, ends left. Now, the place that this uh, can become very obvious that this happens is in stroke patients. Stroke patient may have damage on the right side of the brain. And that damage on the right side of the brain results in motor control depression. On the left side of the body. Now these different uh, tracks, they actually can all be named, and they are going to be named based off of the destination. And you can get uh, some more examples of the naming in Table 13.1 in the textbook. Uh, the, the tracks are going to have or at least many of them will have a prefix, a, a fixed prefix of spina.